Okay, good afternoon. Um, in English, we call this the graveyard shift. It's like after lunch in the afternoon, people digesting. You can't hear me. Okay, is this better? Okay, so in England, we call this the graveyard shift. The afternoon, the food is in the belly, you're digesting, you want to lie down and go to sleep. And I'd really encourage you to take care of your comfort needs. Maybe what I have to say is of interest to you. Maybe it's tedious and tiring. So if you want to cuddle up and have a snooze, this is also OK. Because <laughs> um, that's kind of the, one of the key things about what I want to share with you today is it's optional. Yeah, it's a choice. Um, and what I'm here to do is just to share some of the things that I've been learning about the last years. Um, that uh, we've compiled together, we being myself, Bernard Bockelbrink, an Agile coach from uh, Berlin, and Liliana David, uh, who is my beloved as well as my work partner. Um, and the last couple of years we've been pulling together a menu of best practices that we see people using in different organizational contexts that in certain contexts add value to what they do. Um, so before I get into any of that, uh, I wanted to take a personal way in today because ultimately life is personal, right? I mean, it's easy to forget it sometimes. We get caught up in what we're doing. I was on the aeroplane this morning and actually I was in the airport and I saw a guy who was talking to a Slovakian woman in Munich and was frustrated because it didn't make sense to her to heat up the, bait, the roll that he had with his breakfast. Yeah, they could heat the focaccia, but not the roll. And obviously for her, firstly, English was like her third language, I think, so she was struggling to have the conversation. And for him, he was frustrated, and obviously he had some opinions about whether or not this woman should be able to give him what he wanted. And I realized there was no connection between them. And they both felt uncomfortable, and I felt uncomfortable, and the people standing around felt uncomfortable. And there were these kind of associations and these roles. Yeah? We had the, the pack model this morning, the parent, adult, child. And the, the, parent and adult, the parent and the child were playing out in both of these people. They were kind of flipping backwards and forwards in this conversation. And, and I thought, you know what, today I really want to make the effort to meet every human being like a human being, not like uh, somebody with some kind of role or s some kind of rank or, you know, that I'm above or below. And I thought, what would it look like for me to go through the day like this? And I've been watching myself today and realizing, well, actually, it's quite difficult because I've got so many things to do. And I had to set up the room and move the chairs and prepare for the keynote. And I'm nervous. And I really dislike standing in front of big groups of people, especially at the beginning, and sharing about things when I'm not even clear what I'm going to say yet. So that creates some stress. And I realize I'm vulnerable. I saw the gentleman who's organizing the conference. Where is he? I've, and I've, sorry, I don't remember your name. Paul. Paul. Ah, uh, Paul, of course. Paul. <laughs> because I was like, I've got four minutes till my keynote, and Paul's saying hi, and I arranged the conference, and, and I wasn't really in contact with him. You know? and, and I think this is one of the challenges we face as human beings in daily life, not just about being in contact with one another, but being in contact with ourselves. I mean, just take a moment to reflect on what's alive in you right now. I don't mean bacteria. But like, how are you doing right now? What's going on in your lives right now? What epic mountains did you climb to survive to this point in your life, reasonably sane, yeah, to be here today and to commit your time to this? Just because everybody's living life, it doesn't mean to say it's easy, right? And just because everybody's doing it, it can be very easy to think, ah, OK, well, I should just get on, and I should just be OK, and I should just cope and manage. So I see in organizations today a deep longing for soul, you know, a deep longing for meaning. And at the same time, I see intense pressure. I see a lot of waste. I see people doing things in tech, really good at doing things, yeah? Not always so good at doing the right things. I mean, we have many topic, many uh, um, presentations and workshops during these two days to explore how to remove waste and focus more on the right things. But how do we do all of this and maintain our sanity and our humanity at the same time? Is it possible? So I don't know. I think we could. 
I don't know if we will, and sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. But I want to kind of frame the back end of this topic that I'm talking about so that we don't just start in our minds looking for some prescription that's going to make everything better. Because there are no prescriptions that make everything better. The only thing that makes things better is what's most appropriate in each moment. And every moment is different. So, Socioc C 3.0. Effective collaboration at any scale is quite a claim. <laughs> and I'm not here to try and convince you this afternoon in this short time that I have that this is appropriate for you. But what I want to do is give you a taste. Have you ever played that game when you blindfold, like pin the tail on the donkey? And you, you start you're holding something and it's the ear. You know? And you can't really kind of get what it is yet, but over time you feel your way around and you start to get a sense of where you are. Did anyone play that game as a kid or pin the tail on something? I don't know, whatever it was. Yeah. Okay, so talking about this topic is a bit like this. Yeah? It's this kind of thing. <laughs> and we can't really pin it down too much. And what I want to do is just give you a taste so that you can get your hand on somewhere and just get a sense of it for yourself. So, this is me. <laughs> it's my, my self-portrait. Um, so, about 17 years ago, I was super driven. I was quite entrepreneurial. I wasn't a good entrepreneur because I didn't make a lot of money. I was more like um, engaging hobbies. Um, but I had a couple of landscape gardening businesses. I had all of these ideas about things I was going to do. And one day I met a woman. She was an older woman, and she was what I would call a wise woman. Better? I'm anxious because this morning I kept hearing this thing, you know? So, okay, thanks for the tip. Um, she's what I'd call a wise woman. And uh, she knew me a little bit, and she said one day, You know what, honey? When I look at you, I imagine that life will really happen for you when you stop chasing it and listen for the invitation. This is a bit like in uh, software development, right? When we kind of realize the waterfall method isn't such a good idea. Yeah? Like trying to plan and predict and create the perfect thing up front, but instead stopping and listening and checking what is it that's really happening, what is it that I'm really invited to invest my time into. So I had an epiphany in that moment. Because in my mind, I said, no, I have to succeed. I have to be driven. I have to do things. And in my heart, I said, oh, thank God. Finally, finally, I can stop chasing all of these, I don't even know what. So I made a decision that from then on, I would navigate via invitation. I thought, what would it look like if I just listen to life and see where I'm invited and see where I end up? And 17 years later, I'm standing here talking to you uh, via Tomek a year ago when he invited me to come to Poland. So one of the first things I realized was that I was invited to change what I did at that time. And I started to work with at-risk young people. This was a term given to young people who behaved a bit like this in the UK. And I was 26 years old at the time. And for some reason, I thought, I just want to do something meaningful. You know, Building gardens is nice, but it doesn't really give me any sense of purpose and meaning. And I phoned a friend of mine who worked with at-risk young people and said, can I do something? He said, sure, we've got a project. And we're looking for volunteers. Come and volunteer in this project. It's a secure unit with kids who've been excluded from school. And all of the extra provisions that are designed to help those kids reintegrate failed. And now they go into this secure unit. We want to do a gardening project. So I thought, oh shit, just when I was getting away from gardening. Yeah. <clears throat> but it was a great stepping stone because I met these kids. And for some reason, they seemed to like me. Yeah. And we seemed to get along OK, even though often they would tell people to go fuck themselves. Yeah. And I watched how some of the adults dealt with these kids in the, this secure school. And they were really aggressive, and they were threatening, and they were using command and control and power over. And if these kids didn't do what they were told, then they suffered horrible consequences. But the kids, you know, many of them had been so hurt in their lives that they'd made a decision to not feel vulnerable anymore. 
you know, to not feel vulnerable again. And so they would just fight back. And literally, there would be physical violence between these people who were caring for them and the kids who were being cared for. And I think what it was that was different for me was I understood something about how they felt. And I started to think about these kids and the fact that they didn't have any meaning in their life. And they were looking at the normal cultural rules and ways that people behaved, and they were saying, no, this doesn't work for us. You know, I don't like the way you talk to me. I don't like the way I'm told I have to do this or do that. And of course, we all need to learn to adapt ourselves to the social constraints. Yeah? But what if some of the social constraints are just stupid? What if some of the social constraints are designed just to keep people small? You know? And when someone puts their head up too high, it gets cut off. Well, I realized these kids were the smart kids. They were the ones who were saying no to the system, while everyone else was just accepting the status quo and continuing with their life, even though in many cases they were profoundly unhappy, without meaning, without purpose. So, I don't know about you. I don't know the level of fulfillment, meaning, purpose you have in your life today. But I'm sure that as we move forward as a species, there's a the potential for far more fulfillment, far more often than we might experience right now. So how might we go about achieving that in one of the biggest habits we have on planet Earth, which is collaborating with other people in organizations? So, sociocracy, I don't know if you know much about this word, it's a form of democracy, but it basically means rule by the social group. Demos actually means, or democracy really means rule by those with voting privilege. So if you don't have voting privilege, too bad. So depending on the culture you're in, like in the society, maybe you're not a national to that society and therefore you can't vote. Maybe you're not in that management team so you can't vote. Yeah, maybe you're not on that board or you're not those founders or shareholders so you can't vote, etc. Okay. So there can be unfairness in democracy, but what does it look like if we shift the power to decide to those affected by the decisions? Shift power to decide to the social group. So, this is a question people have been asking for quite some time now. And sociocracy was first coined as a term by August Comte in 1851. Comte was a positivist philosopher, and honestly, I, I have big concerns about a lot of his ideas. He foresaw a future society that was more scientific, more empiric, and ruled by the social scientists and by the experts. Now there was an argument for bringing expertise and bringing more empiricism into how we did things because previously we had kind of feudal fundamentalist ideologies yeah, and this more command and control paradigm. And he said it was inevitable sociocracy if we were to survive as a species. And I think he was right because we definitely live in a world today that is largely shaped and governed by the social scientists, by the experts, and by those with the most kind of power to influence. But through the next century and a half, this concept evolved. And in the 70s, a gentleman called Gerard Endenberg took the ideas of Comte and others that followed him and decided that he wanted to create an organization that was sociocratic, an organization where those affected by decisions were the ones to make and evolve those decisions. Yeah, and so he founded the first company in the Netherlands that was no longer owned by somebody, but was owned by itself. They called it the double corporation trick. Because he wanted to remove the potential of him as an owner from influencing that company and to give it ownership to itself so the people could become stakeholders of that entity instead of owners. And today in the world we have the sociocratic circle organization method. It's a lot of words. Uh, it's recognised by the University of it's recognised by the University of Maastricht as a form of social science. There's a certification program, and there's a body of people known as the sociocracy group who kind of care for this methodology. 
And more recently, Brian Robertson, Hall Accuracy. Has anyone heard of Hall Accuracy? Could you raise your hand? Quite a few of you. Okay. So Brian Robertson, unbeknown to many, was very influenced by sociocracy. He was a bit cheeky because he kind of changed some of the terms and tried to get a patent on it at some point, which was turned down because you can't patent a process. And tragically kind of hid the trail of influence of sociocracy on holacracy. But holacracy is a kind of offspin of sociocracy. Now, I've been teaching sociocracy and sharing it with people since 2001. And I was really passionate about this idea of shifting power to the socius. And over the years, I began to realize that these methodologies, these ideas that people had about more effective ways to organize things, well, they were appropriate in certain contexts, but not in other contexts. Sorry. <laughs> um, and so in 2014, I got together with Bernard Bockelbrink from Berlin, and we had a conversation and said, what would it look like if we made a map of the different practices that are effective for people, but put it together into a flexible, modular-based framework of patterns that people could pick and choose from according to what they need? And there was born Sociocracy 3.0. Something to know about Sociocracy 3.0, there's no organization. It was our kind of voluntary endeavor to share these best practices with others. Uh, it's principles-based, which we'll touch on in a moment, and it's free, meaning that everything we create is Creative Commons licensed, and you're welcome to take it, use it, and adapt it according to your needs. So this menu of patterns, currently there's around 72. Uh, and this is some of the uh, categories of patterns. We have patterns for co-creation, for making evolving agreements, for building organizations, organizing work, peer development, focusing interactions, and so on and so forth. And I'm not going to go into any of this with you today. But just to give you an idea of what we're talking about by menu of optionable, optional patterns. So these seven principles. They're woven into all of the patterns. So we have transparency. Be open unless there's a reason not to. Equivalence. People involved, but people affected by decisions being the ones to make and influence those decisions. Accountability. Being accountable for what we agree to. Consent. Doing things in the absence of reasons not to. Empiricism. I think we understand empiricism in this room, so let's test our hypothesis and build on it. Continuous improvement, apply what we're learning to continuously improve so that we can remain effective, doing the right things in effective ways. So, being as it was a graveyard shift, and I've talked a lot, I'm gonna invite you for about two minutes to have a conversation with a neighbor and just ask yourself, one of these principles that you see alive in your organization or not. Okay? Please, conversation. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, I would like to hear just three or four examples on one of these principles. Has anyone got a brief example of one of these principles that's alive in your organization or not? Anyone? Yeah. Open salaries. Open salaries. You have open salaries in your organization. Okay, anyone else with open salaries? Can you raise your hand? 
A few, it's a growing trend, okay. Uh, let's hear some more examples. Examples of these principles alive or not in your organization. Okay, so all voices can be heard, yeah? All voices are heard. Okay, great. A couple more. Don't tell me there was no more. I heard you talking. Yeah. Okay, so open, accessible, and clearly understandable. Yeah, okay. One more example? Principle alive or not? It's a rule in the project. What you agree to, you get done. Okay. We've, okay. We've actually got a pattern in S3 called breaking agreements. Has anyone got any experience in breaking agreements in this room? Come on. <laughs> Why might we break agreements sometimes? Yeah. Why? Oh, why might we break agreements sometimes? Exactly. Sometimes what we agreed yesterday doesn't make a good idea today. And it's good to be accountable and clean up any mess, yeah, and follow through. And if we find ourselves continually breaking the same agreement, it might make sense to change it, no? Okay. So these are the principles of S3. They're woven into the patterns. We have a pattern called Adopt the Seven Principles. You can do it alone and not do anything else, and it's likely to have a significant impact on your collaboration. So I mentioned a bit about prescriptions and methods. Yeah, I've seen over nearly 20 years of working with sociocracy, and now with holacracy coming, and with uh, Scrum implementations, and all manner of methodologies, people over time adapt things to context. Yeah? So, doesn't it make sense to begin with this idea of let's be open, look at the different things that people are doing, but not swallow any pill until we've tested it and if it's valuable to make changes, and let's make iterative changes to what we're doing and learn as we go. Now, this topic was about S3 and enterprise agility. And so I'd like to ask, well, let me put it differently. I observe Agile as a practice in tech is really beginning to grow and refine itself. Yeah. I've learned so much from working with people developing software. It's not my background at all. But people developing software about agility at the operational level. But what about enterprise agility? And I don't know about you, but when I look at organizations as they scale, there's this like often very flat tech end, but on the business end, it gets increasingly hierarchical, increasingly top down, and at some point, you get these conflicts between the two, and it creates impediments to effectiveness, and in the worst case, as the organization grows, it kind of disintegrates or breaks down, yeah, gets sold, etc. So why enterprise agility? I'd invite you to have a half-minute conversation with somebody. Why enterprise agility? Why might that be a valuable thing to develop? Please. Okay, so it's a brief conversation. <laughs> so, brief conversation. Let's hear a couple of examples. See, this shows what's behind the scenes at a conference when you listen to people speaking on a stage and presentations. And there's like so much conversation to be had. Let's hear a couple of examples. Why enterprise agility? Yep to respond to the market quickly. If you think of your organization right now that you're in, and this is we respond really fast and rapidly and effectively to the market, and this is we don't do it very well, please show with your hand right now how effective you are at responding to the market. Okay, 
there's some room for improvement. <laughs> okay, one more example. Why enterprise agility? It's safer, it costs less, you can start on a smaller project and build on that. If you think about the organization you're a part of today and just from your own subjective perspective ask how efficient is it in terms of value, yeah. like creating value versus wasting it. Please show with your hands. This is like we're awesome, we're like super high value creation and this is, we're not really creating or we're even losing with your hands. Okay, better, but room for improvement, right? Okay. So this is a couple of reasons why enterprise agility. Maybe there's more. Actually, we, we don't need that at all. Rather, we should let organizations die and make way for new ones. This is one perspective. I don't have an opinion either way, and some are and will for sure. Yeah, but there's a pretty big organization in the world that we can't get around. Yeah, and that's called the human species. That's called the states. That's called the nations. Yeah, and. I mean, I'm an, I'm an open anarchist. Yeah? I have big concerns about government, not because government as an idea is a bad thing, or governance of people, by people, for people is a bad thing, but when power gets concentrated to a few at the top, then over time, horrible things start to happen. And my point of view is that this is happening in most of our societies today. What do we do? Wait for the societies to die? and start new little ones? I mean, it's one option, but I really like to think that there might be a both-and solution here. Yeah, that some big entities might die, and, but that we can learn from that, and that not every single one has to. Yeah. Death isn't always necessary, it clears space, but it can also be painful and horrible with a lot of suffering. Yeah? And so how do we reduce that? And how can we learn from what's happening now so we can build that into what we do next? So I'm not going to invite you to have a conversation because I'd like to move on, but just for yourself for a moment, ask yourself, what are some of the impediments to enterprise agility? What are some of the, if, we, if we see that we can create more value, yeah, if we see that we're not so good at responding to the market, what is it that stands in the way? Okay, well, there's lack of common understanding. Anything else? Sorry? Ego. Ego. Ego, yeah. I mean, thankfully, we've all got an ego because it means we can do things like this. But when we're just operating and not aware of it, when there's no consciousness and it just runs riot, then it's a very dangerous thing. Yeah. Fear, exactly. Fear, we're vulnerable, right? We're vulnerable. Okay, what else? Desire of power. Desire of power. Who likes power in this room? <laughs> okay, some of you not. But maybe, maybe not. But power is not a bad thing, no? But we need power. Power to cause effect. Power in service of vulnerability. Power in service of human needs. Yeah, so power is not good or bad. It's what we do with it that can be really awesome or really horrible. So, there's many ways to look at organizations, but one way I like to look at it is in terms of these four dimensions. Agility, we're talking about. Participation, how do we raise engagement and accountability and maintain it over time? Agreeing things, yeah, how do we tap the awesome collective intelligence of people, like in this room? How much collective intelligence is there in this room today? How can we tap that and make benefit from it? So it's not just me with my narrow perspective and my limited experience, but it's us yeah, in effective ways. And how can we also free people up to get on and do stuff? So S3 provides patterns that address these different dimensions in different ways. And what's not shown here, and I think I'd like to add it to this slide, is alignment. Yeah? Because overall, we need to do these things to be able to focus energy where we want it to go, to the things that are needed. Yeah? So we also need to be clear on why we are doing things to start with. Yeah, what's the purpose of the organization? Why does it exist? What needs to it take care of? What's the purpose of your role? What's the purpose of your team? What is it that's happening and needed that you are currently investing energy into? So, let's get into the meat and potatoes of sociocracy. One thing that sociocracy does is it shifts power from the individual in terms of 
decision making to the group. So, in a functional hierarchy with a management structure, in a more sociocratic organization, the manager would take the hat off and join the circle to come up with good enough for now, safe enough to try agreements with the people that she or he works with. Good enough for now, safe enough to try. Not awesome, the best, the most amazing, yeah, but as best we can do right now with what we have, and let's learn iteratively and build on those uh, experiments as we go. It's like applying agile to governance. We had apply agile to strategy in the keynote this morning, yeah, and applying agile to governance, to decision making. Another thing that S3 focuses on is a pattern called navigate via tension. Does anyone feel tension ever in this room? <laughs> a few of you. I know you're very advanced in Poland. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I feel a lot of tension. I felt tension standing up here today. I'm, like, I'm a bit tired and I was a bit anxious and I thought, oh, I'm going to make a bad job of this. And I felt my body tight and my heart was racing and my mind was busy thinking, what shall I say first, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But if we look behind tension, we see things happening and things needed. Yeah. Okay, well, what's happening is I have a keynote, and what's needed is for me to do good enough for now, <laughs> safe enough to try keynote with all of you. Okay. So that's my domain of accountability, right? It's my job. But in organizations, all of us experience tension in different ways, in different moments. And if we look behind that tension, we see things happening and things needed. It's kind of like user stories, no? User stories that would be important for the organization to respond to. And in S3, there's an invitation to flow that information to those with influence to be able to decide and act. Yep. So it's kind of like human beings in the organization acting like nerve endings of the living system, sensing things that are happening, asking what's happening, what's needed, and then passing that data to the people most able to respond who then tap the collective intelligence to come up with good enough for now, safe enough to try ways to deal with it. We have a menu of patterns for organizational structure in S3. Double linked hierarchy, this is one way of doing it. But we have many others like delegate circle or backbone or peach. Is anyone familiar with Niels Flaifsling's work? You know, the, the, the organization where the value creation is directly connected to the market. Monetary resources are held here. And these are like the internal services, which could include board and executive and finance and HR and so on. Yeah. It's like they're the, they're, the custom, they're the service providers to them, and they're the service providers to the market. So a variety of patterns that we can use, but not prescribe, but look at where the needs are and where the information needs to flow and ask ourselves, what patterns might serve us to be able to do this effectively? What patterns might serve us so that we can be more agile? One pattern that's particularly profound, I think, for me, and probably one of the most challenging patterns I've ever come across, is called artful participation. If you ever asked yourself, what is it that stands in the way of human beings being able to collaborate more effectively together, then you're not alone. And for me, one of the most profound ways to start addressing that issue is by asking ourselves this question. How often do you think you might ask yourself this question, were you to consider pulling in the pattern of artful participation? Six monthly? Each sentence. Each second. Yeah, as often as you can imagine to ask yourself. This is a pattern of S3. Just to give you an example, when we talk about a menu of patterns, there's another one called Be the Change. Yeah. So be the change you want to see. I think there was a slide about that in the keynote this morning as well. This, I see, is one of the most common patterns that people are adopting from S3. We heard of a company here in Poland who's just framed a2 posters in silver frames and put them in every meeting room in the in the organization, which is quite exciting and challenging. So artful participation. There is no magic formula that's going to make it all better. Yeah. At the end of the day, the only thing that makes it better is us learning to collaborate more effectively together. 
And for that, we need to learn to be more accountable. For that, we need to learn to be more self-reflective. And we need to ask ourselves as regularly as we think to do so. Is this behavior that I'm acting out from right now, are these habitual patterns and strategies that I'm running on in this moment really the greatest contribution I can make to our collaboration? And if not, what might I do differently? So finally, doing the work, so as I said, I'm really impressed by tech. I think it's just awesome. Uh, when Bernard and I said, where should we target first? We said, let's target tech, because I think it's one of the most advanced environments and communities of people in terms of awesomeness at getting stuff done. Not always so good at cross-team collaboration, you know, dealing with cross-team dependencies. And certainly those skills aren't reflected in the governance of the organizations of those, those um, uh, tech teams. But still, I think we've got a lot to learn from what many of you are doing on a daily basis. And good governance, in my opinion, leads to less governance. We want to make decisions that free people up to get on with doing stuff as much as possible. And only when it would benefit from or necessitate a group decision to bring those issues back to whichever group is most able to respond, to come up with good enough for now, safe enough to try experiments, and then learn as you go. So I was on a workshop that I was running in Barcelona a few months ago. And this guy came up to me afterwards and he said, he showed me this drawing. He said, I was trying to place S3 in my mind, like where does it belong? Where, if, if you wanted to pitch this to corporates, he said, I was thinking, what would you need to tell them? And he said, well, you need to tell them that it improves performance yeah, and improves alignment in the organization. He said, because many companies, that's the two things they care about. And he said, but the other thing I realized, having been in your three-day courses, what sociocracy offers is a framework that can help and enrich you doing whatever else you choose to do. It's not a replacement. You know, it's not a formula that you use and then throw everything else out. It's a complementary set of patterns that you can use to enrich whichever your preferred practices, processes, culture may be. And we often get asked, well, how do you bring in S3? Do you employ expensive consultants who come in and create a change plan for many millions of dollars and then encourage you to implement it and mandate it throughout the organization? No. What we invite is that people invite change. I don't know about you, but I don't consider changing at all unless I see a reason to do it. If someone tells you, hey, you need to change something, and you can't see a reason why you would want to change it, do you want to change it? Of course not. You know, a friend of mine, Daniel Mezik, he's a controversial character. He, do you know Daniel Mezik, anyone? He wrote the culture game, and he's developing open source agility. On his Skype handle for a while, it said, ranting at the futility of mandating agile. Because it's a hypocrisy of terms, no? So, like force agile onto people. It's like walking into a workshop and the course facilitator asks you to act like an animal. It's just weird. You know, and if you can't see why it makes any sense to you yet, then why would you ever want to do that? But if you can see value in it, I don't know, maybe you can see value in acting like an animal. I do it on a regular basis, um, <laughs> involuntarily. <laughs> yeah. When people see a reason to change, then they'll change. And until then, they won't. So by inviting change and beginning by being the change we want to see, telling our story, I'm telling my story to you. Tomek shared a little bit his story to you at the start. And inviting others, hey, want to come and experiment with this? You know, addressing real topics, real issues that are a priority and a concern to us. Then we can learn together, yeah, gather the data, share it with others, and if it makes sense, then people will naturally become more interested and naturally over time begin to do it for themselves. So I'd like to wrap up with just a couple of thoughts. Firstly, I see that all behavior is in service of human needs. 
If I'm behaving like an asshole, which I often do, not meaning to particularly, but when I'm really vulnerable and I'm stressed and I'm not comfortable to feel... Oh, I thought I turned the sound off. Uh, I'm not comfortable to feel vulnerable, then I can get... I can behave in other ways, yeah? But if I look behind, there's human needs behind that behavior. And I imagine it's the same for you, actually. Yeah. And in my experience, the majority of human beings, unless they're sick, damaged, really traumatized, we all mean the best with what we have. And interestingly, all collaboration is in service of human needs too. Yeah. Not necessarily all collaboration is in service of all human needs. And I definitely think this is a problem we need to look at as a species. Some organizations exist to deliver value to a very small set of people with needs and disregard the fact that other people have needs too. This is an ethical question that we need to ask ourselves as we move forward together. And one thing is certain. The consequence of our actions or our inactions will inevitably be inherited by those that follow. And just like the consequence of the actions and inactions of those that came before us, we inherited. And I'd like to close with this picture of my son. This is Yathiel, and it's his birthday on Sunday. And it was my birthday last week. I turned 43. I don't know how it happened. It seemed to get here really quick. And I had some health things the last couple of years, and it got me thinking, well, I could be gone any moment. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you've got kids or family with kids, or you just feel how delicious and vulnerable and amazing kids are. But when I think about him, which I do like on a more often than I think about artful participation, yeah. I feel some concern about the world he's going to inherit. I feel really excited because there's awesome things happening. Like here, there's awesome things happening. And we could be amazing, and we are. But I don't know what we will do next. I only know what I'm going to do next. And that's the best that I can to ensure that whatever I leave here, I can leave in peace. Yeah knowing that it was the best I could offer, the greatest contribution I could make to our collaboration. Thank you.